Faith is to believe what we do not see. And the reward of this faith is to see what we believe. December 8, 2004, is the 150th anniversary of the Papal Bull in Ephibilis Deus. This teaching raised the belief in the Immaculate Conception to the status of a formal doctrine, to be believed by all the faithful. It may be the most misunderstood teaching of the Church. It is often confused with the faith belief in the virgin birth, that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born to a virgin but it does not refer to the birth of Jesus. Immaculate conception does not mean conceiving a child without having sexual intercourse. To be immaculately conceived means to be conceived and born in the usual manner, but with one major exception, without the stain of original sin. Mary needed to be completely free of sin to bear the Son of God. The Immaculate Conception is not about Jesus, but about Mary being conceived in the womb of her mother, St. Anne. The dogma of the Immaculate Conception explains how Mary did not inherit original sin like the rest of us who were also conceived and born of human parents. The conception of a child is seen as more than a physiological event. It involves the soul, a relationship with God and love. The Gospels tell us nothing of Mary's parents, Joachim and Anne, but tradition, found in the Apocrypha, informs us that in their old age they came from Galilee to settle in Jerusalem, and there the future Mother of God was born and reared. Saint Joachim has been honored from as early as the sixth century in all countries. Saint Anne is often represented as teaching her little daughter to read the scriptures. The dogma defined by Pope Pius IX on December 8, 1854, declared, The most blessed Virgin Mary from the first moment of her conception was, by the singular grace and privilege from Almighty God, in view of the merits of Christ Jesus, the Savior of the human race, preserved immune from all stain of original sin. The doctrine of original sin attempts to explain how sin affects humanity in our world. Human nature was damaged at the time of the fall. Consequently, from the moment of conception, all human beings are born with a predisposition to sin and are powerless to overcome it without divine intervention. Because of this sin, we are subject to physical and spiritual death, and eternal life is impossible unless we are reconciled by Christ's incarnation, death, and resurrection. Mary was entirely free from sin because of God's grace, but she too needed to be redeemed by the merits of Christ. For her, these merits were given to her in advance. If you have difficulty understanding this doctrine, don't fret, you're in good company. Several theologians, including St. Thomas Aquinas, have struggled with this teaching. Greek theologians never discussed the Immaculate Conception as such. They spoke rather of the holiness of Mary, which meant for them that all her life she was free from sin. The Holy Conception of Anne was celebrated as a feast in the Eastern Church, and during the centuries it moved across Europe. The faithful knew instinctively that there was something special, something holy about her conception. As this feast began to be celebrated in the Roman Church in the West, it was called the Feast of the Immaculate Conception and encountered some controversy because of the terminology and the questions it raised about redemption. The Church in the West was firm about two things. First, every human being inherits original sin and bears its consequences. Although man and woman were made by God in a state of holiness, from the very dawn of history, they abused this liberty at the urging of personified evil. They set themselves against God and sought fulfillment apart from God. Transmitted by the first parents to their descendants, original sin is a sinful condition which affects all human beings except the God-man, Jesus. From this comes the attraction to evil, 
which we call concupiscence, which is present in each of us. Many theologians believe that although Mary was a member of the human race, she did not have this sin. Second, all theologians believe that Mary, like the rest of us, needed to be redeemed by Christ through his death and resurrection, providing us with a new dilemma. If Mary needed to be saved, would this not mean that she had to be saved from original sin? The answer is yes. It took the genius of the Franciscan theologian, John Duns Scotus, to answer the dilemma. The most perfect way for Christ to redeem Mary from original sin was by preserving her from ever having been under its influence. Centuries before medicine ever spoke of immunization, Scotus referred to illnesses that are cured and those that are prevented. In both cases, he said, they require the intervention of a physician. In this case, Christ. Original sin into which all human persons are born is a state of sin, not a personal sin. According to St. Paul, the first sin of humankind was disobedience to God. Theologians explain this spiritual death as an inability to love God above all things and our neighbor as ourselves unless and until we are rescued by the grace of Jesus. Why is this so? A reasonable answer would seem to be that to live by these two commandments implies self-forgetfulness, sacrifice, which implies the cross. We could never embrace the cross without the gifts of faith and love, and these come to us in baptism. Even after baptism, there is a struggle, but we can win the victory in Christ. In view of what God would one day ask of her, namely that she be the mother of our Savior, Jesus, God created Mary's soul and gave her a special grace which prevented her, even for a moment, from ever being under the influence of this spiritual death, original sin. This gift constitutes her as an absolutely free person, as one who would love God above all things and her neighbor as herself throughout her life with no reservations. Everything she did was a total response to God. Her freedom is what we mean by her holiness. Because Mary was without original sin, the angel greets her with the words, Hail, full of grace, or perhaps more accurately, Rejoice, O highly favored one. From an artistic point of view, the concept of the Immaculate Conception has been visually represented from the time of Scotus. Religious symbols suggest the inexpressible mystery that we sense but cannot adequately explain. These symbols are used to strengthen the faith of those who may be in doubt. The moon, sometimes shown as a crescent, refers to Mary. The dramatic use of light expresses the mystery of Mary's great exemption. Her glory is reflected from Christ, the Son of Righteousness, as the light of the moon is reflected from the sun. The snake symbolizes original sin, the fall of humanity, and recalls the words of Scripture, I shall put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. It will bruise your head, and you will strike its heel. Throughout sacred Scripture, we encounter firm faith in the God who directs history toward a single end, the salvation of His people. Many scholars believe that in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation, both Mary and the church are symbolized as the new Eve. The woman who was to bring forth the little child, the Savior, is pursued by a horrible monster, a personification of evil. Protected in an extraordinary manner, she was able to give birth in safety. However, the child does not immediately destroy the evil monster. He is taken up into heaven where he reigns with God. Our attention is fixed not upon him, but rather upon the woman who remains exposed to the dragon's hatred even after her son has been enthroned. She is an example of the law of suffering and renunciation, which marks the road to salvation, a road to be taken by the church and Mary as its symbol. 
In the early 19th century, the world was experiencing the advancement of modernist ideas, the progress of the sciences, and socialist ideals throughout Europe. A secular and anti-clericalist atmosphere threatened the religious world of the time. Wanting to counteract this threat, the U.S. bishops requested of the Holy See that Mary be made the patroness of the United States under the title of the Immaculate Conception. The holiness of this woman would serve as a beacon to those looking for guidance. The request was granted in 1847. The National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. was constructed beginning in 1930 from the contributions of Catholics who wished to honor Mary under this title. It is the seventh largest religious building in the world and the largest Catholic church in the Western Hemisphere. Pope Pius IX, prior to his definition of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, asked the bishops of the world to inform him about the devotion and expectations of their clergy and their faithful and their own personal feelings with regard to this doctrine. Saint Eugene de Mazenod, founder of the missionary oblates of Mary Immaculate, was then Bishop of Marseille. To the people of his diocese he wrote, she has given us him who is the world's life and salvation. She has engendered all of us spiritually at the foot of the cross through the pangs of the passion and the death of the God-man. She is rightly called the new Eve. Her tenderness watches over us. He enthusiastically sent two responses to the Pope's request, one as Bishop of Marseille and one in the name of the Oblates of Mary Immaculate, pointing to the congregation's title a title suggested by Pope Leo XII, as a testimony to the Church's traditional belief. Bishop de Mazenod was at the ceremonies in St. Peter's Basilica when the definition was made. St. Eugene de Mazenod learned from his mother's devotion to Mary. A man of deep faith and open to the supernatural, his trust in Mary was outstanding. He fought valiantly against all distortions in Marian devotions and reminded the people that the greatness of the Blessed Virgin consists especially in her dignity as Mother of God. It is the Son whom we honor in the person of Mary. God always remains the supreme end of all this homage. The missionary oblates of Mary Immaculate, the congregation of priests and brothers that St. Eugene founded, were not approved just to proclaim the glories of Mary. They are missionaries under the patronage of Mary Immaculate, but consecrated to God in the poor whom they must see through the eyes of the crucified Lord. They remind each of us of our dignity coming from the fact that we are created in the image of God. The charism of their founder calls us to preach the gospel to those who are most abandoned wherever they are found. Mary, with her vocation as mother of God and mother of all peoples, is certainly unique and incomparable. How many of us realize that, like ourselves, she is a member of the laity? We may sometimes imagine her as a nun who has taken vows, yet she was a poor Jewish handmaid, considered insignificant in the social structure of her time. She was vowed to her husband in marriage and then widowed. Throughout the circumstances of her life, she said yes to God and received Jesus in faith in order to share him with the whole world. Mary's Immaculate Conception, her total freedom and commitment to God, assures us that the kingdom of God is in the process of being established on earth. Despite the sin of our first parents, God has never abandoned us. God broke through history to complete the first work of His goodness by a mystery yet more wondrously sublime. The Word made flesh came to show us that we can move beyond the darkness, fear, and chaos to enter the world of love. Yeah!